Hi, everyone. It's super refreshing to see everyone in person. I think I mentioned this to each and every one of you here. And a warm welcome to those who've joined us online. Uh, it's great to be here. We also do appreciate the extra safety steps you all took to be here, showing vaccination cards and whatnot. It's not to be taken for granted. We can all be here without COVID is progressing. So I really do appreciate you taking those steps. Now, as Ken mentioned, I promise to keep this brief. We have a full day ahead and no one here wants to hear me babble. I know that for sure. Everyone here and online, whether a client, a partner, a regulator, have heard me speak all too much. So I'll keep this brief. In 2019, when Saldus founded DACOM, there was no dedicated forum to address the crypto native risk and unique compliance challenges digital assets posed. Since its inception two years ago, which is in crypto years a decade, we were humbled and honored for the amazing feedback the market had for DACOM. We've hosted market, leading market participants and top regulars all in an effort to advance market integrity. We've also found incredible partners committed to advancing market integrity and industry standards, including Crypto Compare, who have helped us to put this event today, which I thank you. <laughs> and lastly, and what we always keep in mind at Solidus is that crypto and DeFi's promise of better financial opportunities depends on us. Those who live in the market day and night in this 24 seven ever dynamic market to address market integrity, consumer protection and regulatory concerns. And with that, I'd love to introduce today's keynote session on that very topic the maturing state of crypto regulation and investor protection. Now I'll address our speakers. I'll ask Jay Clayton to come to the stage. Jay, who serves as the chairman of the SEC from May 2017 to December 2020, is a senior policy advisor and counsel to Sullivan and Cromwell. He also serves as an advisor to our friends at Fireblocks and sees a critical role for blockchain and capital markets infrastructure. We share a more casual style for those wondering. I am calling him Jay because that's what he prefers. In fact, he told the SEC staff to just call him Jay, so we're doing that here as well. Joining us on the screen, it is my pleasure to welcome the current chair of the SEC, Gary Gensler. Chair Gensler is a, the second person to serve as the chair of both the SEC and the CFTC. Also, as we all know, he's no stranger to crypto, having taught the course on blockchain and money at MIT. It is a great honor to host this conversation between these two gentlemen, and I'm going to let them get this started. Jay, on to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this works. Thank you, Asaf. Um, do we have Gary? <laughs> there he is. Oh, good. good. There he is. There he is. All right, all right. Well, I'll, great to see you. Great to see you. Uh, it's been it's been a it's been a long time. Yeah, Jay, Jay you look like you have fewer gray hairs now that you're uh, <laughs> out of the job for about a year. Well, well, that's a that's a good segue because I think people are here to hear you, not me. So, uh, <laughs> but if but if you ever want to uh, turn the tables on me, feel free. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I might do that a couple of times. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, so, so look, let's just uh, let's kick it off. Uh, Chair Gensler, uh, markets are ever moving. I mean, a conference like this would not have been thought about five years ago. Um, and I applaud uh, the group for putting together a compliance-oriented conference for a new space. It's uh, important. Um, just a broad question: your your assessment of where the SEC is and knowing that it's ever evolving where it needs to go uh, with respect to the regulation of crypto. And I know that's a broad term, but over to you. Well, I thank you, Jay. And you, you, you grappled with this. You came on board in 2017, a little bit earlier time in, in the crypto asset class. Um, but we at the SEC are an investor, investor protection agency. I mean, we have the three-part mission of investor protection, capital formation, and that which is in the middle, the markets. But at our core, 
everyone that's had the honor to be chair of this agency know it's about investors. And I think where we are right now is we don't have sufficient investor protection in this space, this $2.6 trillion asset class, worldwide asset class. Uh, you grappled with it, uh, we're grappling with it now. And I think that uh, uh, new technologies do not long persist if they stay outside of the public policy framework. And this is an investment asset class and it needs investor protection or people will be hurt and trust will be undermined. And uh, so for those in the audience that are thinking, uh, why, why has this got something to do with me? I think if you're a proponent of any of these projects or this space, uh, without uh, trust, the public uh, is not going to stay with this class uh, in the sufficient numbers that you would want long term. Yeah, well, look, I think uh, you know that I agree that investor protection is uh, uh, the touchstone. Uh, and thinking about the long-term interests of our investors is, is the lens through which the staff at the SEC looks at everything. So, um, but let's, let's, uh, let's talk about where we see this going because, uh, let, let me say this, uh, I'm, I'm now an advisor to uh, a couple of firms in this space and I'm sure that other firms that I advise are in this space, so let, let me get that on the table. I, I see promise for this technology, um, great promise in inefficiencies, um, but I also see, like you do, that only happening in an environment of trust. If you look down the road, where do you see the opportunities for crypto technology, digitally represented assets, uh, and the like? Look, we already, uh, one, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to stay technology neutral. That's my job. Uh, I'm not public policy neutral. I think that investor protection, capital formation, and that in the middle of the efficient uh, markets. Uh, um, 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 took an oath of office to, to really make sure we achieve those. But I think that the technology itself, with Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever she or he was, sort of has been a catalyst for change. It's it's uh, around the globe, uh, those in the payment business, central banks and private sector have started to think about payment systems a little bit different. There's, there's some competition, so to speak, from decentralized, bearer forms of value transfer. Now, some people will call it currency, but uh, none of these projects have really taken on a full general uh, embodiment of a medium of exchange, unit of account, and store of value. They've primarily been speculative stores of value and ways, as, as you so rightly said in 2018, and I think as recently as 2021 in a Forbes article, I, I, don't, I don't think you mind if I would quote you back to you, Jay, um, that, that these have largely been, I think you are even more uh, aggressive than that, but largely been about raising money for entrepreneurs. And, and as such, uh, meet the time-tested um, definitions of an investment contract and are thus under the securities laws. Yeah, and, and any other uh, of the array of definitions of a security in addition to an investment contract. Uh, and, and you've done a great job of articulating the principles behind that, which is the asymmetry of information between the project leaders and, and the public from which you're seeking funding. It's a fundamental principle that we have. And quoting back to you now, uh, uh, Chair Gensler, the, you've used the term Wild West, um, which uh, I took, and let me, let me say how I took it and then, and then get your reaction, was you were comparing this to a, a time when private currencies were, were proliferating, um, unregulated, unstable. And I tie that to the financial crisis um, and instability in uh, money market mutual funds and products where people looked at it as um, a safe store of value. Is that the right perspective to interpret your comments? Well, I, 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 my wife was an artist and she always said that uh, uh, let others interpret what you say or what you do. <laughs> um, but so that would be one interpretation. We did have a period in the 19th century in the US with multiple forms of tradable value paper, currency, if you wish. It was banknotes. It was the wildcat banking era. 
uh, after uh, Andrew Jackson had his little fight with the Second Bank of the U.S. Um, but I would say it's more than that. I would say it's more than that. There's just there's a lot of projects uh, that have gone live, entrepreneurs raising money in 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 the crypto markets, and they're turning to gatekeepers, uh, lawyers to try to paper over, saying how do we how do we sort of avoid the authorities and i don't think that's the right approach but that's similar to the wild west how do we avoid the authorities and and i think so there's an analogy there as well and i i speak to the gatekeepers a little bit the lawyers the accountants the advisors and say think about the spirit of our laws and think about how we protect the public against fraud and manipulation and that's why Congress painted with a broad brush. There's over 30 definitions, 30 pieces of the definition of security. And Jay Clayton was right. It's not just investment contract. There are many other pieces of it. And I, I'm not here to prejudge any facts and circumstances of individual tokens. But to the gatekeepers, bring your projects into the SEC. Talk to us, whether it's a trading platform or a token and uh, find a path to registering and getting within the investor protection remit. Well, that, that sort of warms me up for the next question on my list, which is a lot of investing in um, crypto assets, digital assets, is retail. How do you see institutional investing involving in this space? You know, I don't know how it's going to evolve, but I think it, it, it's not going to evolve well outside of uh, the tenets of public policy. And I'm, I'm speaking about investor protection, but it's also guarding against illicit activity, what's called anti-money laundering and, and uh, sanctions and the like, tax compliance. It's also guarding for financial stability. And I think that institutional investors uh, want to see more uh, 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 progress made also on custody, because at the heart of this technology, if you steal the private key, the, 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 uh, the cryptographic key, you steal, steal value. And so there's a bunch of places uh, to make progress. Number one is what's the value proposition of any of this. That's for the markets to decide. That's not for the official sector. But for the number two is, ensuring that it's within public policy frameworks. Okay. So with that, a little, let's unpack that a little bit. Pe people refer to CFI and DeFi. I, I like to think about it as a number of central nodes in a, in a, uh, in a system, uh, a clearinghouse, for example, an exchange, um, an issuer, and the like. And people talk about DeFi as eliminating uh, some of those nodes. Um, Assume, uh, as, as I do for most people, that, that people have the best intentions. H how do we look at regulating a system where we're moving from CFI, where we, we regulate the nodes, it's very efficient to regulate at those nodes, to a more decentralized uh, system? I see that as a challenge. Nate, if I can ask you, you say best intentions. You, you talk about that some people would have incentives to avoid the any money laundering laws or incentives to avoid, I mean, because, you know, Bitcoin's being used for ransomware around the globe. Is I mean, there's like incentives here uh, to use a bearer form of value transfer. And that, uh, that's what a lot of this is. It's a bearer form of value transfer. We already have digital money. Yeah. We but use it every day of the week. We use digital money. Um, so what do you mean when you say you view you yeah let me try and make this easy intentions. let me try and make this easy um bearer instruments we've dealt with for the last 50 years we don't tolerate bearer instruments you know let's just let's just leave it at that what what i'm what i'm saying is using the combination of cer certain technologies i know you're technology agnostic but tokenization together with smart contracts to drive efficiency in in let's say the traditional as well as the new digital asset space if, if what you're doing is eliminating, for example, a clearinghouse or allowing just peer-to-peer -peer transactions, how, how do we look at that, given that, we're, given that it's not bearer instruments, but we want to be able to bring that type of form 
into our regulated environment? So um, I think that what you find, economics does drive usually towards some centrality. I think that uh, it's rare to have a trading market, a lending market that doesn't have some centrality. A history of, of finance tells us that. But let's take what you just asked about peer-to-peer. -peer. Mm -hmm. We had peer-to-peer -peer lending start. It was so-called peer-to-peer lending start 2005, 2006 out of Europe, came to the US and everything. And the SEC uh, had to, at that point in time, sort of say, how do we address this? Mm -hmm. It took two or three years. It took, uh, yes, an enforcement action. Uh, yes, it took the definition of what is a security. In that case, I think it might have been the Howey test, but it might have been another one, uh, to say that the so-called peer-to-peer lending platforms were actually raising money on the one hand, pulling those uh, funds, offering a return, and based upon their efforts, uh, 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 then, you know, lending that money out to others. And I think that the so-called decentralized finance uh, has spurred some real innovations, but it still has some centralization. It's offering, uh, in many instances, a, a return. Some of the tokens inside the platforms have governance, have uh, rewards, have staking fees or other returns. So um, again, sometimes I, I toss it back to you, uh, Chair Clayton, uh, is that uh, you, know, you had to grapple with this for three and a half years in the job. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot of these things, whether they're decentralized, so to speak, there's, there's, there's important aspects about these that are providing the traditional financial um, uh, yeah, services. Look, I think we're, um, you know, not surprising, I think we're very much of the same mind on this, which is what, what is the form and function that's being provided? What is the product? Um, and map that to the traditional product space and, and look to that uh, for the type of regulation that applies. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's an old saw that you probably well know and your audience maybe is familiar with, but similar activities should have similar regulation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so new technology came along in the 1990s. It was called the Internet. And then our predecessor, Arthur Levitt, who was a fabulous chair of the agency, I think we could have some bipartisan agreement on Arthur being a fabulous chair. And... Uh, uh, did we get bipartisan agreement on that? Yes. Okay. All right. Like you know, but Arthur's commission. I mean, it was many commissioners had to grapple with what do we do when the internet comes along? Do similar activities still get similar uh, protections, investor protection, and like? So if we call something centralized finance and it's a platform, the the big trading and lending platforms have commingled activity. They have custody function, they have trading function, they have order routing function, they they match buyers and sellers. Mm -hmm. So shouldn't we have the same protections of custody, of order routing, of anti-manipulation, guarding against wash sales, having the transparency in those markets? for the retail public and the institutional public you mentioned to benefit from uh, those kind of common sense rules of the road that in our case were adopted by Congress in 1934 to clean up the stock market of the 1920s. Look, I think your um, analogy to the digitization of trading or the electronification of trading, however you want to call it, um, through the 90s into the early 2000s is a very good one. Because I think the message that Chair Levitt brought to the space was prove that the regulatory functionality is at least as good as the old method, and then feel free to capture the returns that come from uh, innovation and better technology. But, you, but start with the baseline that you have to do the regulated side of this at least as well. Right. And so what I what 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 we're saying at the staff level, what I'm saying as a chair is to the platforms. And I think I just want to make a, a note that platforms, whether they're trading platforms or lending platforms, whether they call themselves uh, traditional or centralized or they call themselves decentralized, these platforms, these nodes, as you said, 
are really an important place for public policy and investor protection. And, and, and so what we're saying is come in, work with us. If you think there's some reason that you can't quite uh, register as a full exchange, like, uh, are you across the street from uh, the stock exchange there? I'm looking out that window. It looks like Grand Central Terminal, but- uh, Grand Central, okay, you're not downtown. It's a different kind of exchange. Different type of exchange. <laughs> But if you if you know then work with us if the transfer agent rules or the or or like don't quite work but you know you've got order routing you've got you've got to think through the anti manipulation and how we guard against manipulation in these markets you've got transparency both pre trade and post trade um, these are hybrids does it make sense that they're hybrids or would it make better sense to sort of disaggregate and pull the custody piece out of the exchange piece. And so work with us and, and, and sort through, um, again, uh, where appropriate, we're going to use uh, uh, the enforcement tool. It's something that I think that while you were chair was used five or six dozen times uh, where you, you thought the facts and the, and the law uh, were appropriate. Um, and we're going to continue that as well, but I think a better path for these platforms, these exchanges and lending platforms, is to work to get registered within the law. Yep. yep. So let's, um, let's turn to uh, ETFs, if you don't mind, and, and limit this to uh, Bitcoin ETFs. And I understand all the constraints that you're under on this, but the, but the commission has approved a futures-based uh, Bitcoin ETF. And uh, there's discussion about uh, a spot ETF. And for, for a period of time, um, probably continuing, the concern about uh, surveillance, and a lot of this conference is around surveillance, surveillance in the spot market um, was at the forefront of people's minds at the SEC. Um, maybe, maybe just comment on that. Do I have the characterization correct uh, about where we stand and uh, where we may be going here? Well, I, I, you, you know better than anyone in that audience as a chair of a five-member commission, uh, we're advised by uh, council not to comment on pending matters before the commission. Um, no, and I'm, not asking, it, and I'm not asking you to do that. Yeah, no, no, no but I, I just wanted to uh, say that, and, and you appreciate that. But I think it goes back to the conversation we were just having in the last five, 10 minutes, that this is a market worldwide market, uh, you, you mentioned Bitcoin, that's 40 or 50 percent of the outstanding um, uh, market value of this, of this two and a half trillion dollar market. But, but the trading around the globe uh, is not inside the U.S. regulatory mm -hmm. uh, register, registered. Um, uh, our, our sibling agency, the uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission, has some anti-fraud uh, 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 authorities but on, on Bitcoin, as you just mentioned. But the overall, these platforms need to come in, get registered, come within uh, the investor protection remit, ensure for the appropriate anti-manipulation, ensure for the appropriate transparencies, uh, deal with the custody issues and the like. I mean, they, they, they know what the list is. We kind of know what the list are. You did as well. I have a question back for you. Why do you think in 2018, 2019 that you weren't, I mean, I'm learning here, but w w weren't more successful to get this, this Wild West? And yes, it was a Wild West back then too, my friend, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, register these platforms. Well, let's, let's look at just a couple characteristics. Um, traditional trading has usually gravitated toward a single venue, and we don't see as much of that in what I would say is the digital asset space. Um, you know, even, even in, in the commodity space, uh, physicals move around the globe and the like, but, but trading has generally, you know, centralized it, whether it's the London Metals Exchange or others, and, Again, you know this better than I do from your, from your commodity days, but here in digital assets, it's very dispersed globally, um, which makes a single regulatory net um, much more of a challenge. Um, so I think that that's there. And, and frankly, um, 
I think in this marketplace, there were a lot of people who, and I'm just going to say this, thought they could throw a fastball by the regulators and decided that they were going to take their chances of, of pushing the regulatory envelope uh, with the hope that regulation would come in that direction rather than stay pinned to its traditional, um, uh, what I would say is fundamentals. But that's, you know, I'm no longer, I'm no longer in the seat, but that was my um, perspective when I was sitting there. Yeah, you know, I don't know, I don't know whether the, the, the history of baseball ties it to the Wild West. I think it might, might be, you know, uh, it might have been in, in upstate New York or something. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I get the analogy in what you're saying. I do think, though, what you find over the history of finance, and we're seeing it in this field as well, you see uh, uh, certain venues taking leading market shares. Uh, just as the New York Stock Exchange competed with the Philadelphia Stock Exchange in Boston and so forth during the 19th and early 20th century, and then it, it coalesced more and more and more uh, around the New York Stock Exchange over time. Um, well, digitization has driven centralization, which is a fascinating part of now we have digitization, you know, in some ways, uh, uh, you know, what, what I would say is uh, disaggregating, but at, at, at at its initial inception, the efficiencies drove centralization in some of these. Right, right. But just as you, we saw with the internet, early days of the internet, you saw loads of competition in the 1990s, and then we've seen highly concentration uh, take on after that. And this is just the effect of the economics of networks, mm -hmm. and that when you can bring two sides of a market together, whether it's whether it's related to uh, uh, online retail that you can bring bring two sides of the market together, or in this online trading of crypto assets. And if I could say you use the word digital assets, we already have digital assets. The US dollar, the euro, the yen, and most of the 7,000 public companies are digital, meaning you buy and sell stock and it's digital. You buy and sell bonds, treasury, uh, you can't, there's no physical treasury uh, debt uh, any longer. So I, I, I tend to call these uh, crypto assets. If, uh, I'm, I'm happy to go with your terminology. I'm happy so. to go with your terminology. So, but let's, let's talk about that and those prior evolutions. And, and part of this conference here today is about surveillance, about bringing market integrity with the, with the concept that without those things, you're not going to have a you're not going to have a market that that holds up and flourish. It, it won't. It won't. We're going to have, and I've said this, but we're going to have a spill in aisle three, uh, and then uh, the public's going to say, where where was the official sector? Uh, uh, and the spill in aisle three might be a financial stability event because the lending in this space is growing. Uh, it's hard to it's hard to get good facts and figures, but it's probably at least $200 billion in size. Uh, the spill in IL3 might come around stable coins, so-called stable coins. It's about $140 billion of these yeah, coins me, right let, now. Let, let me interrupt and, and, there. And the spill in IL3 might just come from uh, a, lot of, a lot of the investing public uh, getting hurt, um, either, either by fraudsters or by good faith actors who are promoting and raising money and the investing public didn't, in hindsight, get enough information. At the core of our bargain in the securities markets is investors get to decide what risks they want to take, but the people raising the money, the issuers, should share full and fair disclosure. Yes, that, that asymmetry that we talked about is, is really one of the fundamental things driving the registration requirements and the reporting requirements of the Exchange Act and the Securities Act, right? It's in right, trying right. to level level the information playing field. And, and, and what what I'm trying to say is is I'm not a minimalist here. I, I spent three and a half years of my professional life honored to be up at a you know a small school in Cambridge called the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and I was honored sort of to learn and then teach and do research at the intersection of finance and technology, both in the AI space and in this space about uh, crypto assets. And, and I, I, I think that it has, as your earlier question, it's driven innovation outside of crypto as well. Uh, Satoshi's innovation was about 
money and ledgers. But beyond solving uh, a, a riddle that had persisted called the, the uh, Byzantine generals uh, issue, um, I think it's also led to innovations that platforms now, trading platforms, could be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and have tens of millions of customers with open application program interfaces, APIs to them. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, don't, we didn't really have that with the Frankfurt, London, Tokyo, or New York stock exchanges. That's different. That's an innovation itself. The innovations around DeFi could be real but they won't persist if they stay outside of the public policy frameworks. And those, those innovations you just mentioned are what I was talking about when I was saying digitization or tokenization, Mo moving from electronic entries to, to those types of innovations that provide for real time, uh, both pre and post trade. And, and let me just, I was gonna interrupt and say, uh, a, a compliment to you and your colleagues on continuing uh, to provide uh, guidance with respect to stable coins. Um, and if, if stable coins are going to provide that kind of functionality, not a, not a stable coin that is really a money market mutual fund, but a stable coin that is providing functionality as a, as a stable store of value, um, uh, how, how is that going to go forward? I, I, I think that uh, you are getting together with the presidential working group and continuing to try and provide guidance in that area. Look, we're, we are working with our colleagues at Treasury and the banking agencies and the Federal Reserve and the CFTC, and, may, and maybe hopefully with Congress as well. I think that to date, this roughly $140 billion has largely been used inside the platforms. They've been, they've been the, the uh, sort of poker chip at the casinos. Uh, and why I say that is because they, they were initially brought forward 2013, 2014 to make the trading platforms more efficient. You could do something 24 hours a day, seven days a week, moving value within the platforms with a crypto token versus another crypto token. And that made it more efficient within that ecosystem, within that but it also uh, allowed people around the globe, the people that tried to, to avert any money laundering and tax compliance in jurisdiction after jurisdiction. And so it, today, these stable coins are about 80%, let me repeat it, 80% of the trading in the crypto markets, probably even more of the lending is lending of a stable coin versus mm -hmm you know, Bitcoin or something. And that is, that's the nature of what we have. And so I think that we should recognize that. And, and again, the platforms come in and get registered, work with us, see what, what uh, we need to do to, you know, fit some roles that were written in a bricks and mortar era, how we adjust them, uh, uh, but bring it in. And on stable coins, I think that, as we said in this joint report with other agencies, it's really important, uh, I think, as a principle, that they're backed one-to-one, -one, mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. really have the backing, that that's fully transparent to the, to the various appropriate regulators. Uh, if, it's, if it's like a bank account, then, of course, you know, uh, other regulators take uh, uh, leadership. And thirdly, that it's inside the, uh, I'll call it the anti-money laundering and tax compliance perimeter, but backed one-to-one, -one, fully reserved uh, inside the public policy perimeter. Uh, yeah. uh, th th those are the key principles. And, and I'll just say that from, from my perspective as a citizen, former regulator, we've had so many hard-fought wins in AML, combating terrorist finance, uh, tax evasion, we shouldn't be giving those up. You know, that's, that's just fundamental. And, and those wins, you know, uh, have contributed to where our markets stand today. You, you mentioned- it's not, it's not, say, I don't think it's, it's all that surprising. The economist in me says this, we layered over our digital money system uh, about 40 years ago, any money laundering and, and various sanctions regimes in, around the globe. 
Uh, and we layered that over a digital currency system called our banking system. So about 28 years later or so, in 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto writes this paper in part, you know, as a sort of reaction or whatever, an off the grid type of approach. It's not surprising that there is some uh, competition that you and I don't support, but it's a, an economist. There's some competition that's trying to undermine that worldwide consensus on any money laundering. Yeah, the, the, the creation of new, what, what's often referred to as the illicit or black market, the creation of, of new markets of that type is as old as regulated markets. Correct. Yeah, well, you, and you mentioned your regulatory colleagues. Let me just uh, end here with the cooperation uh, across this space that is necessary because it's not just securities laws, it's commodities laws, it's banking laws, it's financial stability. How, how do you see the cooperation evolving with the CFTC, et cetera? It's good. I mean, uh, uh, Chair Benham, Russ, and I uh, talk on this uh, regularly. The staffs talk regularly. We also do with, with uh, uh, Chair Powell and his, his team, with uh, Secretary Yellen, with uh, 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 Acting Controller Two, um, with Yelena. Uh, McWilliams. So we're 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 all kind of uh, we we have a little bit different uh, remits and different missions, but particularly between the CFTC and the SEC, uh, the two market regulators, we're we're working together uh, in part because to the extent that some tokens um, uh, are, are commodities uh, and don't meet the time tested. Uh, you know, a broad remit of a security, how do we deal with that there might be, in essence, some silver trading on the New York Stock Exchange or gold trading on the New York Stock Exchange, along with the thousands of other things that trade on the New York Stock Exchange. So we're, we're working to get together to sort through that. Um, but not... Right now, the public is not protected as it, as it could be and as I believe uh, it ought to be uh, in this space. And I think for those of you in the audience that are thinking um, about the, the longer term future of this, this asset class and these projects, because it's not just the asset class, it's the projects, it's the technology. If you're thinking about that, uh, just, just sort of look at the history. Uh, Technologies don't long persist outside of public policy norms. Um, people get hurt. Trust is diminished. Uh, it's 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 far better to bring it inside the the uh, the policy frameworks, and that's what we're going to try to do at the SEC and continue to work with platforms as as they come in and and uh, where we think that uh, uh, they have crossed the line. Uh, we'll bring will bring the appropriate enforcement actions. Yeah, yeah. Let me, um, we have just a few minutes left, and I know, I know you're, you're up against your, your time limit. Let me, let me say uh, a couple things. If there's any final comments that you'd like to make, I, I think you made it at the beginning. I think it should be emphasized that in our securities law regulatory area, we very much have relied on the professionals to uh, help startups and new companies uh, ensure that they, they stay within the bounds, and I think you emphasize that. I tried to emphasize that. But, but Chair Gensler, any, any final comments and, or questions for me or the like as we, as we wrap up here? Um, no, I mean, look, you know, I mean, it's a tremendous privilege to be in a job like this. I mean, from, you know, number 33 to number 32, <laughs> um, you know, uh, and, and, it's just in in this in this space. I mean, you grappled with it. You 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 took it over the office during the middle of 2017. The whole asset class was probably, if I had to guess, worth about 100 billion dollars, but it could have been 50 to 100 billion at that point in time. And you saw that bull market run to to nearly a trillion dollars right right at the end of 17. So your first six months in the job. Uh, and uh, I, I guess my question back, what, what do you wish you had done differently? I mean, you know, uh, during that period of time. Um. Well, look, I, I applaud uh, the staff, the staff that you now have, because 
you saw that, and we got the Dow report out fairly quickly, letting people know, look, just because you call this a token doesn't mean it's not a security. And, you know, uh, let's put it this way. One, one thing that we haven't talked at all about, uh, Chair Gensler, is there are trillions of dollars raised in the private markets every year in compliance with the securities laws. You can do a private offering in compliance with the securities Absolutely. Laws. And there Absolutely. are trillions of dollars raised in the public markets every year. And you can do an offering compliant with the, with the public aspects Absolutely. of our securities laws. Um, I, w I was surprised that so many people wanted the private markets regulation with the public markets offering and trading after having established for 75 years that that's not what we're going to do. So I was surprised um, and let people know that the securities laws apply, uh, give them time to comply, and then people who d didn't comply, you know, that we have, these aren't my decisions, these are, these are the staff's decisions as to uh, pursuing uh, cases and the like, and, but letting the public know that this is an area where regulation is going to apply. And I think this conference is all about trying to bring this very promising technology within a regulatory net where we can have the appropriate public confidence. So that's, that's how I looked at it. Yeah, and, and I'd close on this because it's a conference on surveillance back to the, the lawyers, the accountants, the advisors, consultants, the technologists even. You, you, you operate in a space that uh, innovation is happening and the like, um, but you, 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 and you have clients and you feel compelled to give your clients your best advice. Um, but I also think, I ask you to think about the public interest as well, that you're gatekeepers. And um, if, they're, if they're stepping over the line, bring them back over or have them talk to the CFTC or us or the banking regulators, depending upon what they're trying to do, um, to talk to us and to, to do it, uh, within within the uh, the frameworks and within the law um that gatekeeper function is is real um uh, you might not feel it on a daily basis but i i leave you with that that thought because the the investing public's gonna uh, benefit if if your projects and your clients are doing stuff on the right side of uh, investor protection and consumer protection and guarding against illicit activity and the like so. well Chair Thank Gensler. you, Jay, by the way. Pardon me? I'm sorry. I said thank you, Jay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, everybody, can we thank Chair Gensler for his time? <laughs> Great to see you. Next time it won't be a year. All right. Thank you. <laughs>